every hero needs a good villain to battle. And in this ranking video, we are going to be where I am going to be ranking all the villains from all Ninjago villains from the worst to who I think is the best. Now, just for a note, Chief Mamatis will not be included on the list as I don't really consider him to be a villain and he wasn't really viewed as one in the context of the island. So, other than him, everyone else is fair play. So, with that in mind, let's get started. Ronin. Ronin is the true villain of the island, not Chief Mamatis. And honestly, Ronin just feels like he was just placed there. Honestly, he really kind of just feels there for the sake of being there. That's why he's pretty awful as a villain. Some characters just simply do not work as villains, and Ronin is one of those examples, especially since he was introduced in the series as a good guy. Now, I know what you're about to say, but he was introduced in Shadow of Ronin. While that's true, not many people know that the game even exists, so their first experience with Ronin is in Season 5, Possession, where he was introduced as a good guy. Maybe not a good guy immediately, but then he eventually turns into a good guy. And then Season 6 came around and kind of erased all that development, so he had to build it up back again. And this is a big problem with morally gray characters. They have to stick with one side. They can't just flip-flop on a dime, um, which is kind of ironic since, you know, the reason for this is because of money. And also, that design you see for the island, that's just atrocious. What have they done to you, Ronin? They made you have this awful design when the old one was clearly superior. Anyways, Ronin as a villain is just straight up terrible. He doesn't even really have a motive other than money. He's basically the Ninjago version of Mr. Krabs. Money, 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 money. Asphira. Oh boy. We gotta talk about this woman snake, whatever you want to call her. Um. She basically is the second female main villain. Honestly, I feel like they only made her female be to capitalize off the success of the Harumi character. But, unlike Harumi, this fell flat on her on its face. For starters, her motive is pretty childish and pretty laughable. She basically hates Wu um, for thinking he betrayed her when in actuality she's the one that betrayed him that seems fine on this on the surface right but when you look into the reason why it's pretty pretty funny Wu Asphira thought she, he was betrayed by Wu was because Wu used forbidden spinjitsu to defeat Asphira thus implying to her that As that he was hiding secrets from her and while that may be the case in in one sense it's also not that way in another perspective and honestly it just makes her come across as a petulant child essentially instead of a villain um with a score to settle and honestly she's been memed so much by the community that basically her reputation is just destroyed at this point. So, to send off this particular entry, I'll just do it. REVENGE AND THE TREACHEROUS DECEIVER! <laughs> Iron Baron Iron Baron could have been the next great Ninjago villain, but unfortunately, Due to the fact that he was overshadowed by Harumi and Garmadon in Season 9, that just wasn't the case. But he had all the qual the qualities that a good Ninjago villain possesses. I mean, he had a pretty good motive, he was basically a jerk to everyone, and his way of doing things is really, really dark if you think about it. He's basically 
living off of this world of well, he's making everyone fear him and fear the Oni, even though he knows that it's a bloody lie. And it's like it's like profiting off of a dead person. Like a certain somebody that I know. Um but anyways, he could have been a really, really good Ninjaka villain. But unfortunately, he just didn't work in the grand scheme of things, which is such a shame considering his potential. General Vex. General Vex was pretty good, actually. He was the actual true villain of the Ice Chapter, not Zane at, or as the Ice Emperor. Vex was the one who betray who um, manipulated Zane to do his bidding, and it appeared that Season Eleven was finally going to get some sort of traction with him being a pretty detestable villain for what he did to Zane, and he had a pretty he was had pretty good momentum. Um, especially with his dynamic towards Lloyd in, I think it was, uh, A Fragile Hope, which was awesome, by the way. Um, but unfortunately, the ending kinda made his character fall a little bit flat. Now, a lot of people have actually th liked this ending for the character, but I'm not one of those people. He basically kinda ends the same way he started. I hate this type of storytelling, and I hope Ninjago never, ever uses this type of storytelling ever again, because it's pretty lazy, and it makes things really just anticlimactic. And while it makes sense in a narrative perspective, you have to have a payoff, otherwise it's going to leave the viewer feeling unsatisfied. Um, and I really wish Vex w was thrown in prison, essentially, because... Just having been exiled where he could potentially just do this shit again to another person just shows that he doesn't learn. He has not learned. And while I do understand that some people just don't learn from their mistakes, you can't imply that. You can't just say that people just, villains just don't learn from their mistakes when villains in the past clearly have shown regret and or remorse for what they have done. So, I feel that Vex could have been another one of those cases, but they chose to go with a more heartless direction, which didn't really make all that much sense to me. Also, um, just as a side note, a lot of people really only liked Vex because of his mustache, which a lot of people compared that to uh, dictator Joseph Stalin. The Omega. The Omega should have been a great final villain for the Masters of Spinjitzu era, but unfortunately due to the time length of Marcinioni, that just wasn't the case. Now, I personally believe that if a villain possesses godlike tendencies or is a god, they don't really need a reason as to why they're doing things, as it's kind of part of their job, in a sense if they are a god of destruction. Like in this case, like in this case, since Omega is destruction. And Omega is an Oni, which in Japanese I think it means demon or devil, essentially. Um, but if he, this was a character design contest, like villain designs, he'd be at number one or number two. I mean, look at him, he is terrifying. The only one who comes close to it is Overlord's Golden Master Form, honestly. That, I might make a list video of that later on. But, for the time being, I really think Omega deserved a lot more, considering he had loads of potential, similar to Iron Baron. But unfortunately, due to the time length, it just wasn't meant to be. I also really like his voice acting from Zach LeBlanc who did a tremendous voice, even if it's kind of like the Overlord where it's hard to know what he's actually saying. And he's a pretty damn powerful person, as he easily beats Lloyd and Garmadon with pretty much straight-up ease. 
But honestly, I feel like he really needed a backstory in order to solidify his tremendously underdone character. And I really think he had a lot of potential to be one of the best villains in the series. Master Yang. Master Yang is a very weird villain. He was the villain of Day of the Departed. But a big problem with him is that he's basically never really focused on that much, along with Cole. Yet, Cole is the focus of Day of the Departed, so it's like, why are you not focusing on him when he's the focus character, you know? And Yang honestly kind of feels incomplete. Because his backstory basically was he found the Yin Blade to achieve eternal life. And while that's good and all, then there's the line, but something went wrong. What was this something? Explain story, explain! This point is never explained upon, and it makes us wonder what exactly went wrong in this case. It was never elaborated on, and has never ever been elaborated on ever since. which is. Which is kind of underwhelming in in a case in this case, um, because Yang could have been a pretty good villain even if he was only reserved for a special. Um, I do like that he turned to the good side in the end, um, and his motive for doing things is a little weird and awkward, especially when Cole pointed out to him that you know he's never going to be forgotten when that was his biggest Yang's biggest fear of being forgotten. But when Cole reminds him that you created a jitsu, it's like, you know, he all of a sudden remembers who he is. But then, literally two installments later, Air Jitsu gets dropped. So I guess in this case, Yang's biggest fear came true. He's pretty much forgotten about by not only the fans, but by the Ninjago characters themselves. Lame Rumi. Oh, I'm sorry, I meant Harumi. Oh my gosh, people. I, I swear to God, people love her way too much. I mean, she's not a masterfully written villain. She's an average written villain at best. I mean, her motive is quite filled with holes. And it really questions her intelligence. Like, she all, she somehow knows Lloyd has Oni blood, but somehow doesn't know that Pythor even exists or who even set up Garmadon for the final blow, aka the ninja, the one she's trying to persecute. And why is she going after Lloyd out of everybody? Lloyd was a child during the Great Devourer attack, so he did not even really participate all that much. And if you're going with the excuse with he's the leader, that's not even a good argument considering, you know, he only became the leader because of his, because of his, you know, ability to lead. But at the time, he wasn't the leader, so it makes no sense. Um, and honestly, part of me really thinks a big reason why she uh, became popular is because she's the first female main villain. So, all the boys in there who love Arumi just love to jack off to her. <laughs> but anyways, I feel like she's in really a superbly overrated villain. And honestly, I never really liked her story with Lloyd as well. It just didn't work with me, honestly. And while the twist of her being the quiet one was, was good, that's the only good thing I could say about her. And she was pushed to the side in Season 9. And she was given a kind of weird conclusion by making her a good person all of a sudden. It's like, well, I guess that shows that even the most terrible of people can feel things. But it's kind of weird and abrupt, if you ask me. But anyways, I think she's just mid at best. Narakan the Jin. I think he's pretty overrated, honestly. 
Um, he is, though, pretty interesting as a character. I do think he's pretty interesting. However, I don't really consider him to be one of the best villains. I, um, but I still think he's a fine villain, regardless. Um, he's actually the only villain to actually, in my opinion, have two motives instead of one. His first motive is why he um, wants to fight the ninja, or wants to get rid of the ninja. And that is because, due to the events of possession, uh, his world basically came down, essentially. His world basically collapsed, and Jinjaga fell as a result. But... This edition kind of feels forced, and it really feels really convenient for plot's sake, honestly. But the second motive is what brings him down, honestly, and that is the why he wants to marry Nia. Because Nia and Delara look the same. Are you kidding me? That is the worst reason I you could have put. Um, it's like, I don't know if this was really bad since I've never seen the movie, but in the movie Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice, I heard there was this awful twist involving um, some thing about, you know, Batman trying to kill Superman, but they he can't because of someone named Martha. Martha. That's what I heard. You gotta tell me more info about this in the comments since I don't know the full information since I don't watch Marvel or DC movies. But anyways, um... That's what it kind of feels like to me. It just feels like a very terrible explanation to why he wants to marry Nia. So, yeah. And also, him mar trying to marry Nia is pretty disturbing, at, if you think about it. Because that's essentially pedophilia. Which is gross. Which is gross. Um, so, while he, while he is somewhat sympathetic... He is also somewhat detestable, and that's kind of, I think, why he's pretty popular. Because he's sort of that best of both worlds in that case. But, I don't know, he just doesn't stick out to me like some other villains do. Garmadon. Now, you might be shocked at the, his placement in this list considering, you know, I've said before that Garmadon was my favorite villain. But when I looked back on it, I noticed this. Whenever Garmadon is an ally or an anti-hero, he is straight up awesome. He is a savage. And that's why I love about him. His dynamic with Lloyd in Season 1 was just perfect. Like, it was so heartwarming that even though he was considered to be bad, quote-unquote, he still loved his son. And that's why I liked their dynamic in the older seasons. Thank- yeah, so fuck you season 8 for ruining this dynamic. I don't care if you try to explain it as the dynamic turned on its head. You ruined what was basically the perfect dynamic. Um, but anyways, and also in season 10, he's also really good. He's also pretty funny in that season. But whenever he's a villain... He's kind of boring and bland and generic, essentially. In season 2, he was eh. In season 8, I couldn't like him, even if he only appeared in two episodes. And in season 9, he doesn't really develop all that much. The real development of his emotions thing started in season 10. He doesn't really, doesn't really form until then. So he's kind of just bland, essentially. So that's why he's pretty far down on this list and not towards the top like a lot of people think you that I might put him there towards the top so yeah Samukai Samukai was the perfect starter villain but he was just that a starter villain he was pretty basic and nothing else and that's kind of why he works so well in the pilots. He isn't too complicated, as the pilots weren't really meant to be all that complicated. Um, but I really like him for that reason. Um, but later seasons have proved that you can write more complex villains, 
so it kind of makes Samukai very forgettable. It also doesn't help that Samukai's um, presence in Day of the Departed is also rather forgettable as well, as he gets pretty easily defeated by Jay. And what's weird is that Samukai and Jay never really had a connection. I mean, it would have or fitted more if Samukai went together with Kai, since you know Kai and Samukai fought to get fought against each other in the pilots. So it would have been a neat parallel to that. But whatever, I guess he's okay. But in the long run, he's kind of forgettable. Master Chen. I used to despise Chan back then for just one reason, his voice. His voice back then to me was so irritating, I just couldn't um, care about the villain as about the villain. Um, then when I, you know, got over that stupid phase, well, I still think the voice is somewhat irritating, he is basically a psychopath, and he kind of reminds me of Emperor Palpatine where he basically plays both sides, but he's secretly a bad guy. He's trying to be a good guy and a bad guy at the same time, where, but he's truly a villain, whereas the good guy he, that he plays, quote-unquote, is just a facade. He basically set up both Serpentine Wars, and it's the reason that Lloyd even exists in the first place, is he basically um, forced that whole love um, triangle thing with um, Lo not Lloyd, Wu, Misako, and Garbodon. And unlike the rebooted Love Triangle, this Love Triangle actually does make sense, considering the one thing that that sparked it all was a letter that Chen basically forced Garbodon to write Wu's name out and wrote Garbodon's name in to imply that Garbodon wrote those sweet words to Misako, but it was in fact Wu. And this lets, leads to a heartbreaking scene in which Wu and Garbodon, who are brothers, mind you, basically hating each other, and it and it's a pretty emotional and underrated scene if you think about it. So he has done a lot of damage, especially to the Garbodon family, and the fact that he did all of this is pretty remarkable. At actually, it it honestly it makes me like him a lot more than I once did. So yeah. Chen, you are a monster. <laughs> Pythor P. Chumsworth. Pythor is a very, very charming villain, if you ask me. Especially with the British accent that he has. Um, which does make him more appealing in that case. And also, when you think about what he truly did, in order to survive, it's pretty dark. I mean, he pretty much had to eat his entire tribe just to survive, making him the last remaining anachondri. Um, and he pretty much set out to awaken the Great Devourer to pay for the humans burying the Serpentine underground. And then the Great Devourer just, just eats him. And then he comes back in season three as the stranger, I mean, and when it's revealed who he is, Pythor takes on a new appearance. Instead of being all purple, like this picture shows, he has purple and white. And he actually has a new sort of distorted-ish voice to accompany with that, which was, which was awesome. And he was pretty good in season three. And then he, he appeared once again in Season 4, but actually as somewhat of a good person, sort of. Not really, though, because he really did it only for his own interest, as he wanted to be big again. And then at Day of the Departed, he comes back one more time to fight Lloyd, and then he just somewhat disappears. Um, it's, and I guess Lloyd was wrong in this case. The, vi the villain, the best villain was the one who got away was not Harumi, but in this case, Pythor, as Pythor has never been seen in the series since Day of the Departed. And I really want to see Pythor again one more time so we can actually get a clean defeat by the ninja. The 
the Skull Sorcerer. The Skull Sorcerer is a very unique villain. As he... He is kind of unique in the case that... You know, he kind of has a identity that the, that the ninja want to see. But hidden under that layer, there is just a monster. Similar to Harumi being the quiet one, or Crux being Dr. Saunders. Um... And while I don't think the the twist of him being the skull of King Vangelis being the skull sorcerer isn't as good as Harumi being the quiet one, it was still a good twist nonetheless. Especially since a lot of people thought the skull sorcerer was in fact Klaus, who you know a lot of people theorized that, including me at one point. Um, but if I'm being honest here, I feel like I like the King Vangelis character over the skull sorcerer character. Mostly because King Vangelis just is so mysterious, like he's hiding something. And the fact that he still loves his daughter, even despite what he's done, is kind of reminds me of the OG Garmadon. Um, he knows he's evil, but he still lo loves his daughter regardless, as he kind of tries to protect her in a sense but ends up disowning her as a result. So, in a sense, a more extreme example of Garmadon. But I do think he's a pretty good villain, but he's kind of underwhelming in certain areas. Unagami. At first, I was questioning of whether to put Unagami on this list entirely, due to him not necessarily being a villain, but more so of an antagonist, which is something completely different. But, since a lot of people do consider him a villain, I decided to put him on the list. He is a very interesting case, because as I met in just a few seconds ago, he's not really a villain, as Jay states in the final episode. He's more misunderstood than anything else, as he doesn't understand why his creator, Milton Dyer, basically just shut him down. And he basically goes on a rampage just to discover answers. Which, it is, when you think about it, is kind of sad, honestly. Imagine being misunderstood and not knowing and not knowing why your basically your parent, your guardian, just straight up abandoned you. That's pretty sad, which is why he is a very good parallel for Jay, as Jay mentions in the finale, that they were basically not that different. And they, they're really not that different. They were both abandoned by the people they consider to be guardians, and they don't even know why. And... And I really like this dynamic between the two. I just wish it was focused on a lot more. But uh, unlike unlike most Ninjago villains, at least Unagami got the ending he deserved by a mutt be turning into a child. <laughs> um, and at least he got a happy ending as a result. The Overlord. The Overlord has been getting a lot of hate in the community as of late for being this born and bland villain. But because of him being essentially a deity, like I said before with Omega, I don't believe this is the case. I believe this actually benefits his character rather than harms it, because I believe he works this role to basically perfection. And I just love his voice as well, even if it's hard to know what he's actually saying sometimes. He's just there to destroy and just slay and conquer. And he does this role masterfully done. And honestly, I really don't understand the hate for, for this character. I really don't understand it. Um, especially considering his golden master form, it, the design is incredible. Even though in Season 3, Overlord was kind of a sissy since he doesn't feel like an intelligent, you know, he doesn't feel intelligent like he once was in Season 2, um, since he kind of let Pythor do most of the work, but that was the only, that's the only case where he just kind of is a little iffy, um, but either way, the Overlord, I just love to pieces, and I truly believe he's an underrated gem of a character and a villain.
Crux and Acronix, otherwise known as the Time Twins, even though they look nothing alike to each other. Um, the E's duo, this duo is a is a force to be reckoned with. You should not mess with them, as they used to at one point possess the four element parts of time, speeding time up, slowing time down, stopping time entirely, and reversing time. Now, even without their powers, they're still a pretty good match, and not someone to take not someone to take lightly. And I feel like a lot of people give them a bunch of crap because of the season they appear in, Hands of Time. And while they may not have the best dialogue here and there, their br their sibling-like dynamic is fun and pleasing to watch, especially since how Acronix lo loves technology and Crux is just, you know, despondent of it. It reminds me a lot of me and my dad, where I'm Acronix and my dad is Crux. Um, but I do think there was a missed opportunity to turn a Chronix into a good guy, considering, you know, Crux is taking the one thing he loves away, in this case being technology, by reverting Ninjago back to the pre-technology state. Um, and Golden Hour didn't really help the Time Twins either, since, um, since, as you all know, Hands of Time ended with a cliffhanger, but because of the Lick of Ninjago movie coming around that round later that same year, it kind of just felt like the Time Twins were simply abandoned. So when it was revealed that um, in this year, when we were getting a short dedicated to the, what happened to the Time Twins, or at least that's what was seemingly appeared, everyone was so hyped up. But then... It didn't really answer the question. It provided more questions than answers, since the only question that really got answered in the Golden Hour short is how Wu became a baby, and that was due to the reversal energy, the reversal energy from being hit with the reversal blade. Other than that, it, the answer to where Acronix and Crux really are still remains a mystery, which is a shame considering I like the, this Power Hour duo. Kalmar. Kalmar is the most recent villain out of, in this list, and oh boy, did he do his job as a villain to basically near perfection. I mean, he is one of the most detestable villains in Ninjago to date for what he's done. Let's go over what he's done, per se. First off, he basically is a complete jackass to his own adoptive brother. He basically refuses to give him any sort of love whatsoever because of him not being quote unquote royal blood. So essentially he's a racist. Next, he murdered his own father for the sake of power and then blamed it on the ninja. How heartless do you have to be to kill your own dad? I mean, you have to be basically have no soul or just have a huge hatred for your own father to go that far. And uh, he was just downright hateable, and I love it. He's like Vex, but way better. And he actually has a pretty, very good conclusion to him being just straight up eaten alive by Wojira. And it's unlikely we'll see Kalmar again since Vojira is ba was basically vaporized not long after he was eaten. And also the voice acting for Kalmar is really good. So thank you, Giles Pantin, for voicing this character. You truly are a magnificent man. Morrow. What can I say about this dude? This dude is just straight up awesome. I mean, he has a very, very tragic backstory. He was basically a homeless child, essentially, and Wu took him in and essentially became Wu's adopted son, in a sense. And he thought he was destined to be the Green Ninja. But when the Golden Weapons didn't respond, which some people pointed out that there was an animation error, that it was just a golden katana and not actually the Sword of Fire, and I remember someone made a meme out of it, 
but I digress. But when the Golden Weapons didn't respond, he became jealous, he, as he felt like he earned the title of being the Green Ninja, and he f did everything he could to prove himself. But unfortunately, he died as a result, as we see in the in a future episode of Season 5. I kind of forgot. I think it's, what was it called? The, the Grim Path or something like that? The Crooked Path, that's it. Um, but I really, really like him. And he is a fan favorite villain, as he is basically the antithesis of Lloyd, the Green Ninja. Mora will do anything anything it takes to triumph over his opponent, while Lloyd fights with honor and nobility. And he's one of the few villains, um, I think he's actually the first villain to basically turn over to the good side, well, the second one, because Garmadon. He's, but his sacrifice was did leave an impact on a lot of viewers, because a lot of people really loved the dynamic between him and Wu, and I really liked it, especially since how Wu, even though he was angry at Moro for what he'd done, he still liked him. They still liked each other, especially in the finale when um, Wu cries of desperation that they could be stronger together. And honestly, I want to see Moro as an ally, as this was shown in Day of the Departed, um, as he turned fully to the good side. And I really, really like that he's now a good character. Um, and I really, really want Moro to be a ninja. I really do. Especially since the voice actor for Moro might actually be the new Cole now, since, you know, you know the, what happens. Um, so, this would be awesome if Moro could return. But, we'll just have to wait and see.